Welcome back to Wargaming World, my name's Greg. This is a video which is uh, very different from some of the other ones that I've already delivered. This is an excellent interview with Nicholas uh, from just outside Paris and it's his collection of uniforms which are absolutely fantastic. So any wargamer is going to enjoy this, particularly if we're looking at uh, uniforms which are from the Soviet Union, uh, the Polish army from 1939 and France 1940, both cavalry and infantry. So it's uh, the interview that I've had beforehand, so it's audio between uh, two phones, but actually the audio from this really has been uh, super. So if you want to enjoy this, just sit back, relax and enjoy. <laughs> Hi, good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. How are you doing? I'm all right. I'll turn my phone round because uh, it's not. Uh, oh, there we go. We're on the right. Uh, yeah, it's better, better now. <laughs> Excellent. I can see uh, you've got one of the uniforms in the in the background. Yeah, it was. Uh, I I set up something because you know if we are going to talk about uh, uniforms then. I'll do one in the background. <laughs> that's excellent. That's that's really good. well. Look, thanks very much for uh, you know for for taking the call. That's uh, that's really good. And uh, what I'd like to do is just to ask a few questions about your your hobby, so that I can then put that out into the video and people can see that and see these these great pictures that you've shared with me beforehand. So I really do appreciate you know coming on the on the call. <laughs> well, uh, it's my pleasure as well. So Nicholas, so, can I can I just ask you how did you get involved in your in your hobby? What did you you do? You know how long have you been involved with that? Well, I started. I was always uh, passionate about history. I always had a book to read on a subject. Every uh, theme in history interested me, but most of all in military history. And uh, I always looked at reenactment, something that is awesome, but I couldn't really get into it because I was too young. And uh, I, you know, it's it's always a step to you. You have to take the step and uh, go into it. And uh, there was a day in September 2017 in Europe where all private, not all private, but like castles, forts, and everything, they open up to the public for them to visit uh, for free. Uh -huh. And uh, there is uh, an old fort from the uh, Franco-Prussian War uh, near my near my town here that uh, opened to the public and invited some reenactment groups. Right. And uh, at this time, I was collecting some helmets uh, because I wanted to start a collection of some sort. And um, I met this group uh, that uh, my re reenactment group. Uh -huh. the, that was doing uh, because I have two groups. I have the group Far de Lance that does uh, French cavalry, another group when I am doing Soviet, uh, the Soviet Army, the Red ah, Army, right, in, uh, right. the Second right. World War. Yeah. And I met them and uh, I, did, I, I talked with them and uh, I just said, hey, why not? Why don't I join? It's, it seems accessible and I, I can get into it. And that's how I started. Right. And yeah, basically. I mean, it, it's. I mean, what what I've seen of the various different uh, photographs, you seem to have a, you know, a huge collection. So I'm interested just to know the the separate group. So let, let's let's start off with, um, you know, the the uh, Ferdinand. Lance. So let's start with the, the cavalry because that's been that's you know really beautiful. The uh, the pictures that I've seen there. So how how have you been? You know, how long have you been there? What do you do? You know, all all of that type of thing. So, um, in our reenactment group, we represent, in Fer de Lance, we represent the French cavalry from the, from the Third Republic. So, from 1871 to uh, uh, 19, 1940. Uh -huh. And um, so, we have events, we are invited by museums or private, uh, private people, enfin, private, uh, private, how do you say that? Uh, yeah, some other people, and yeah. we go, we go there, and we present uh, our equipment, our uniforms. We tell the history of our regiment that we represent. For example, uh, as you saw the pictures, we represent the fourth uh, fourth Hussars regiment from 1940, mm -hmm. and we tell the story and how they were, how they fought, what they were equipped with, and basically uh, also show the horses, how the, um, the equipment. 
and uh, basically uh, just show history. Right, right. And so, so if we took on the, on the, in terms of the fourth hussars themselves, what did happen to them in 1940? What was their story? Well, during the Forty War, they stationed around the around Paris in the Paris region, and uh, when the when the Germans invaded, they basically did a long march up north, and this is where they fought uh, during. They fought like uh, to cover the retreats of uh, retreating divisions, uh -huh. and uh, they, 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 there are some some events uh, like. They go and clash with the Germans, and then they have to retreat themselves to recover and uh, get some new fresh uh, reserves and everything. And uh, basically, it's, it's just a story of sacrifice because every time they they face the Germans, it's on the defensive, and they have to all, hold on to allow French divisions that uh, that are on the retreat. Right. So they fought from the the, uh, the Ardennes region all the way back to the Paris region. Basically, and when they fought, did they fight as mounted infantry? How did how did they how did they fight? Did they fight on on foot, presumably? Yeah, they fight on the the the, the horses. They move on horses, but they fought. They fight on foot. Right. But yeah. they are also they are also equipped with uh, light armored cars and uh, anti tank guns and everything. So it's yeah, it's like an infantry regiment, but on horses. Right. We are long gone from the from the 1914 with the shiny uniforms and oh. the cyber <laughs> yeah. And and how many people are in the you know in the group? Uh, the, there seems to be a lot on the on the photographs. How how many people are there? We are about ten or eleven, oh, right. but we grow each year. Right. Yeah. Right. But uh, mo mo we are um, problem. Pardon, it's not a real problem because we need everybody, but. On our group, there are four cavalrymen, like they can, they can ride horses, uh, and we we are trying to 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 get people that know how to ride a horse to come join. For example, I can't really ride a horse. I I learned to when I was young, but um, I won't I won't uh, try to uh, to to go in a run like Mutevet and climb uh, and ride a horse because I'm not really confident in this. But uh -huh. because what we have to remember is that in a cavalry division, not everybody was a was a ride uh, a horse rider. Yes, there was some logistics that there were trucks, there were uh, artillery men and everything. Right. So yeah. Right, so in, so in your, because I always wonder, I mean, I've seen a lot of the photographs and then obviously there are beautiful horses as well. So uh, so presumably the horses are owned by some of those individuals, some of the people who are in your group. Um, but yes. Then, so, uh, but the, the, I think there must be more than four because I think I've seen quite a few uh, cavalry where you've gone down the road with them or in some of the, some of the pictures. How, how, many, how many horses are we talking about? Um, uh, in our association, we have um, four horses. I'd say oh, yeah. uh, one is too is uh, still too young to carry uh, someone. Ah, uh, we right. have to wait like four years uh, is a bit too young, but we have to wait like when they are six years old or something, and so that muscle uh, can be tougher to uh, to accommodate someone. But uh, we, when there's event where we need like seven horses, uh -huh. we call up some um, special, um, some special uh, uh, company that yeah. rents horses for yeah. such events. Those companies they work on films. You know, when when there's a film on the wall, they they need some horses, and they call those special companies that provide those horses. That are that those horses are specially trained for this. For um, because you know the. The riding equipment, I don't know how you say in English, but the riding equipment uh, is different from from today standards. Like it's it's leather, it's uh, more crude. Yes. And uh, so those horses are um, used to this, uh, they are trained with it. So uh, that's why we call them because we know those horses are reliable and uh, for a price, you can rent them for an event. Yes, 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 I understand. And one thing I'll just say before we say anything else is, you know, you're saying about how you speak something. Your English is absolutely fantastic. You, you speak great English. So, are you, have you been an English student before, or what, what's how can you speak such such beautiful English? 
well, thank you. <laughs> uh, I'm studying international relations and languages uh, in my uh, official time, like not a, a student, yeah. Yes, so, yeah. But the problem my English is that I have a French accent and uh, it's uh, completely <laughs> horrendous. <laughs> well, I, I, I can say this. I, my whole family speak French. So my, my mother is a, a French teacher and we came to we went to France a lot. My sister speaks French, worked in Belgium, um, and, and so with my father as well. And I remember when I was a child, we went to uh, Normandy, and my my parents always really wanted to speak French when they were in France. So I remember that my father was talking to a waiter, and it was you know just as a normal French conversation. And then my mother also joined in the conversation. And the waiter looked back to my father and said, ah, it must be unusual having an English wife being a French person. So my, so my dad was really, really chuffed that the Frenchman thought he was French because he'd spent a lot of years working in Switzerland and France. I mean, mum was really, really offended that, you know, that her French was with an English accent, you know, so that, that was really Oops. interesting. <laughs> All right, right. Yeah, but it's, it's quite unusual to see the other way around, like, uh, English people talking in French. Yeah, I think it's awesome because, but uh, yeah, some French people don't expect uh, sometimes English or American to speak French. No, it, it, I mean it's such a, a beautiful language, but I, I, I say I feel ashamed that it's only literally I, I, I speak English and that's it, and the rest of my family are all uh, bilingual. So, but anyway, that, that's that's the way it is. I just okay. wanted to, uh, I do want to ask. So, in terms of the hussars, is that uniform there? yours or is that the group because obviously you've got uniforms yourself what, what is it that you collect um so as i said i have two groups i mainly collect um soviet uniforms from the second world war mm. and french uniforms from the 1940 period um the, the uniforms you see on pictures are not the, the groups one they are all uniforms and we try that we can lend some things to uh, to members that don't have like uh, shoes, uh, proper shoes or proper uh, collars or proper shirts. Uh, but uh, mainly those the uniforms you see are those people that they they bought it, they arranged it, they made it themselves. Uh -huh. So yeah, mainly personal uniforms. I have one myself uh, for Usas, but it's like you can buy on internet some things. You can find good uniforms but the problem is that they are not 100 100 percent correct so for example this great coat you see here it's a great basis but it's not perfect so for for example the, bu the buttons that are here are too big and you need i am currently changing them to uh smaller buttons but proper buttons because uh -huh. the, the ones you when you buy when you buy it they are plastic and not really great and so you have to paint them khaki uh -huh. and uh, and then change also change them uh, if you can um for example also the there are some buttons on the colors that is not uh, proper not proper uh, also the i i removed it on uh, on my uniform but there are also some shoulder straps that are too big and you have to get rid of them and get proper ones and the pockets are also too big so you see you can buy the uniforms but you have to do a lot of modifications for it to be proper yeah and i mean I mean, what you've what you've got. I mean, as a as a war gamer, one of the main things is that you're looking at figures and you really want to try and make them as, as accurate as possible. But there's nothing as amazing as looking at actual uniforms. You know, the whole thing that it looks so, um, well, it's so real. I mean, obviously, it looks it, it looks real. What well, you've got so for the uniforms that you you have, is it that you have the fourth hussars and you also have infantry as well, or what, what do you have in your collection? From the from the nineteen forty, um, we'll go on to the Soviets in a second. But just just from the first nineteen forty. For nineteen forty, I have yeah, I have basically the infantry uniform from the nineteen forty five equipment. I don't. Yeah, I think you see what I mean by when I mean the old equipment and the new equipment. Um, no, you uh, see what I mean. Yeah. So so do you yeah. mean? Do you mean, uh, in t when you say about the equipment, do you mean the, the clothes or do you mean rifles, etc? Because obviously you've got some rifles. No, too. Uh, yeah. 
the new when I mean the new equipment is the some ammo pouches and um, how do you say the bags and everything oh, right, they're the quite different. Like that. Yes, yes. Yeah. And um, so I have the new equipment. So with new ammo pouches because the old equipment is like the French uh, World War One e equipment. Ah, they right. basically just change the color, the, uh -huh. co the color of the uniform. And but they, that's it, that's the same soldier. <laughs> right, right, and okay. the new equipment in, that appeared in 1945, 1947, they tried to improve this equipment uh, for the French soldier. But uh, so I collect that because I want to, to show that this, the French soldier is, uh, was modern, mm -hmm. uh, was, uh, were, there were some units that were reserved and had old equipment, but I tried to represent what they, they, should, have, they should have had in 1940. So we have the infantry equipment that I represent the 39 regiments uh, that was uh, origin from Normandy. I had uh, recently joined the group, but sadly uh, with the virus, uh, all events were cancelled, so I couldn't join them. Uh, <laughs> right, I yes. couldn't join. Yeah. But I also have the cavalry uniform that I'm currently building, uh, building, assembling, and uh, I just need the horse now. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you'd keep it in your room, though. <laughs> Sorry? I said, I don't know why you'd keep the horse in your room, though. It might be a bit difficult. But the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the one thing I was going to ask is that, obviously, you also have rifles as well. What's the... Are they... Uh, how, how do you collect those? Well, uh, the rules in, for rifles in France is uh, they are divided in some categories. So you have four categories from A to D. And uh, so A categories are assault, uh, assault rifles and uh, that you, can't, you won't get, you, you, it's not uh, allowed. Mm -hmm. Then there is um, B and C that are, uh, you need a license for that to shoot in, at a shooting range. You need to pass a test and, and everything, background check, uh, everything. And uh, then there is the neutralized. Uh, deactivated weapons of the D category okay. and the D category is what we can buy yes recently it, it, it changed now you need there is a uh, more rules for that for example you need to get the collector's card uh, and and to get that you need to do some address administrative things and you need to uh, uh, sorry for my English but I don't know how to say it well you need to go to the um, to your town's hall and declare, yeah, yes. declare that you have a, a weapon. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Um, but personally, uh, this just made me. I think that's stupid because uh, that can't like this. The the barrel is uh, completely uh, filled up with uh, how do you say that? Skewing things. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. So you can't so you can't uh, yeah, so you can't repair it to to fire again. It's it's useless. Yeah. But uh, so basically, that's what we have. The reenactors we have D category weapons, but there are also some companies that make replicas of weapons, and that's the best deal because a replica weapon is not a weapon. It's just a, a wooden stick with some metal parts. But uh, so that's the best deal, and I hope that with time. There will be better and more repros of weapons to for reenactment because yes, yes. you just cancel every administrative aspect of it. Yes, but it, which, which rifle do you have there? What's the what uh, what type of rifle? So is the, this one is the uh, Mosin rifle, Mosin Nagant from the the Russian uh, the mm. Russian army from yeah. the it's the nineteen forty modification. So that's what uh, the the common uh, Soviet soldier had. Right. In World War II. Right, right. And uh, they are, for, so the, for the Second World War, they were obsolete, but they, that's, they, they, they could produce that uh, more efficiently than the new SVT 40 and everything. And how many rounds does that and hold? That uh, has uh, five rounds of stripper clips that you put in the, yeah. in, the, in the chamber, like this, and you put there. But here, as I said, the, 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 the barrel is filled. So you can't put yeah. anything there. Yeah, yeah. So just before we and go and... Then, sorry, I was just going to say, just before we go and have a look on it or talk about the Soviet forces, I've also noticed that you've started doing the Polish 
uniform as well from 1939. Yes, indeed, I forgot to add that. Yeah, because uh, I when I started doing reenactment, it was to because I spent a lot of time on the, on the internet, on the you know history sites, forums, and everything. And I noticed that the French uh, had a bad reputation. Like they were just French. Uh, cowards and uh, cheese eating surrender monkeys or something <laughs> that uh, uh, I found that uh, I found that really offensive uh, really uh, you know uh, I was triggered as one could say but uh, and I found that a bit unjust because uh, unjust yeah unjust uh-huh. uh, because when you read books and uh, you you culture yourself, I don't know if you can say that, Uh, you notice that when the French soldier, when he could fight, he fought and he died. And uh, that was, mm, I wanted to represent the French soldier by building his uniform, that he fought and it was not his fault if the country was overrun, and he did his part. Uh It's the same with the the Polish soldier. The Polish soldier, uh, he fought tooth and nails against incredible odds. And uh, I wanted to represent that, also that struggle against uh, Nazi Germany in the Soviet Union. So that's why I started this uniform as well. Right, right. I see, because actually the the Polish uniform isn't something that you see uh, a great deal of. And because the, I mean, the difference, I think, despite the fact that, you know, the Battle of France is six weeks long, the reality is, you know, France are in the the war all the way through, whereas up to the end, let's say, uh, at the end of June 1940, and then in all in all different ways. In terms of Poland, you only think about it in terms of you know September 1939. Again, obviously the Poles fought all the way through, but in terms of the actual you know the the, the invasion of Poland, and therefore you don't see a great deal of it in terms of war gaming, or at least I, I don't see a great deal of it. But actually, it really is. It's not only interesting, but the actual. Um, uh, challenges that they faced and the and the uh, the battle that they had, you know, being attacked from both sides. In fact, essentially being from from four sides. I mean, the bravery of that was 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 tremendous. Yeah, yeah, that's also why I want to represent it in in France because the reenactment scene in France it's basically all Normandy, nineteen forty four, uh-huh. and the D Day and everything, uh, and then it's. Perhaps 1940 for the Second World War uh, re- uh, reenactment. I mean, but uh, you basically never hear, hear of the Polish campaign of the Eastern Front, basically. And uh, yeah, that's why I want to to show that people fought before 1940. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, absolutely. And I, I, you know, it's really good as that being built up. So I, I'll, I'll, you know, put a lot of those photographs. Uh, again, out in this uh, the video that we put together, I've I've then seen obviously there's there's a lot that you've got in terms of the Soviet Union. I think, and I might be wrong here, that one looks like I don't know whether it's a marine uniform or a naval uniform. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's uh, um, the yeah the marine uniform from the navy, the sailor uniform, uh, the Red Fleet, where what the Red Fleet was wearing, and. Uh, yeah, that's what I have. I have also the the basic infantry uniform. Uh, I'm, bu- I'm assembling uh, a tank uniform, um, tankist uniform. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to represent all branch of the Red Army. Right, right. I see. I have seen as well a photograph with you um, with a what looks like I think it's an anti-tank rifle. I think it's, it's a, I don't know what you <laughs> French, I think it's a twenty millimeter AT gun. I think. Yeah, it was the PTRS-41 um, uh, anti-tank uh, rifle, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, we, uh, we have uh, in our group, uh, on my Soviet group, we have one guy that uh, is uh, really into firearms, and he knows an armorer, uh-huh. and uh, he had he had this anti-tank rifle uh, for, for sale, <laughs> And he surprised us with it at the event, and it was, I was like, oh, you just get, get us uh, an anti-tank rifle like that uh, by surprise? <laughs> yeah, but uh, of course it, of course, it's neutralized, it's yeah. deactivated. Yeah, and then I've seen really fantastic photographs with uh, like a Shah B, and uh, I think there's also the, uh, like the infantry track um, 
vehicle. Is that the Lorraine, is it? I'm not sure which one that is. Ah, the, the Chenillette Renault. Oh, right, yes. The, uh-huh. It's like the universal car, yeah, yes. but uh, for French units. Yeah. 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 Uh, we have in, an event in France in September. It's called the, the yeah, so in French it's La Journée de la Chenille, which means track day, tracks day, right, like yes. you know, the track on a tank. Uh-huh. And so that that's like an event where um, uh, people that owned vehicles of the Second World War, so Sherman tanks, Char B1. So the Char B1 comes from the tank museum in uh, Saumur. Uh-huh. And uh, they sent uh, a couple of things, uh, small things, <laughs> like a charmy one. And uh, they hold this meeting every year. Uh, I hope this this year it uh, will be it will take place. I hope so. And uh, yeah, these fantastic uh, vehicles and restorations, and uh, they also invite some reenactment groups. Uh, I went there as an in, not as a with a group, but just to take photos, and uh, really, it's a sight to see. <laughs> it, uh, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, would, but the, the Shah B out of any, you know, if you're doing war gaming, the, the, out of any of the tanks, British, American, German, whatever, the Shah B is my favourite because for me, it looks like it looks like a World War One kind of vehicle, but fighting in World War Two. The huge, you know, howitzer at the front. And the tiny, yeah. you, you know, the tiny turret, you know, the, the, it's it, its whole design, you know, it's enormous, and it looks like it would be really difficult to knock out, but at the same time, completely impractical, you know. But it, it, it's a, it, it's a fantastic model to put together. Yeah, I I, re- I heard you. I watched your video when uh, they talked about that uh, you were more afraid if you were playing the Germans, you were more afraid of a B one. When you play 1940, than when you are facing a tiger in 1944, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. because you have nothing to take it out. And yeah, the Germans struggled a lot with it uh, during the 1940 campaign. Uh, if have you heard of the Battle of Stone, for example? Uh, it, the Battle no. of Stone. No, no, I, I don't think so. What 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 happened there? So uh, it was the, it was uh, like the Vol- Vol- Verdun of 1940. Okay. Uh, it was. It's a stone. is a small village in the south of the Ardennes region. So the Germans broke through Sedan, and then they they went through uh, stone. But in stone, there was a French counter attack uh, with the Germans attacking. So basically, the two forces clashed at stone. This the village changed seventeen times in the course of four days, mm-hmm. and uh, at. One of those days, there was a, f- a column of uh, German uh, armored cars and Panzers, Panzer Freeze, and that uh, there was one B1 tank, the Char Leur. So Leur is the name of the, pan- the, the Char, the, the tank. Yeah. And uh, it, it knocked it knocked out 13 uh, German tanks and two AT guns while receiving 100 the uh, with no damage received. Right. Uh, when after the after the the, the the run they came back and they noticed that they had 139 uh, shots on the hull but uh-huh. no damage at all good grief right so thanks in a day it's uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it was a monster it no, was a monster uh, no absolutely I, I, and that's why you know when you you you, um, you see that as a yeah, it's, it's a remarkable vehicle, really. When you look at it, and you're thinking that it's some, it's so somewhat out of place in terms of the you know the other other fast vehicles and what have you. And then and then I think I think yeah. it was uh, modified by the Germans to have a flamethrower in it. I think I think that's how they then they then used it. So I think it was still in service, but just used in a in a different way. Of course, yeah, you you are absolutely right. They made they put a flame for on it, <laughs> right? <laughs> because why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, so what? What I'm just going to ask is, I'm, I'm you know really conscious. I'm you know taking some some time for half an hour of this chat, which is really excellent. Is what moving forward? What are you going? I mean, I'm conscious where we are with you know COVID nineteen, etc. You mentioned about hopefully there's an event on in September. What what are things? Uh, happening, you know, for you, you know, just outside Paris. What, uh, you know, what, what, what does the, the next few weeks look like in terms of, well, the hobby and, and you generally, you know, with the family? Uh, really, it's, uh, 
I don't really know. Uh, the, the sad thing in that in my region, I'm living near Paris, there's not a lot of events. But uh, I have an event coming up in Ju early July, uh, where I'm going to be as the fourth USR. Uh, and it's, but it's in Moselle, it's in near Alsace, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in the, on the Maginot Line. And uh, yeah, basically just that event in July, early July. And uh, I hope in September it will take place, the event I was talking about. But nothing is less sure, like, we don't know, it's... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's sad. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Actually, well, one a question I do want to ask you is, obviously you do reenactments for, and the, and the uniform for France 1940, how does that compare in popularity to, say, Napoleonic's uh, representative? You know, is there a lot of, of that type of thing uh, happens in France? Well, uh, I think... Um... If you do uh, like uh, a rank between uh, different types of reenactment, I think Napoleonic is just above uh, the World War Two scene. Right. Uh, I think there are there are, but it's it's a really distinct world, like it's different reenactments. Uh, I don't know a lot about it. I know that there are really passionate people in that uh, scene, but it's really distinct from World War Two. Uh -huh. as you might expect but uh, yeah I, I think uh, 1940 in the World War II scene it's beginning to grow up a, a lot uh, since the last two years uh, I'd say uh, but in France it's most of the reenactment is US reenactment from Normandy you know right I think right. yeah I think you can put France 1940 in the second place then there, there are British, perhaps. Uh, I can't say, I, I don't have figures, but uh, I'd say that's my rank, I'd say. But and how, and yeah, how, it's, it's, it's growing, it's growing. And how, how do, um, obviously this isn't, you know, it's a sensitive question, is it, you know, France, World War I, and, you know, the, the terrible impact of that war and to the, to the nation as a whole, are these sort of, reenactments or war games things like that is this is a is it a sensitive thing or is it a popular thing how you know what how do people feel about this type of uh, you know reenactment of war particularly on you know in, in a country which has been you know so so affected by it well um, I think it's pretty well received and uh, we see that the state the um, and particularly the Minister of Culture is, is beginning to, in, to, to be interested in reenactment and what reenactment can offer to a vision to, to show history because it's a great medium, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you see a lot of reenactors uh, that um, on the 11th of November and the 8th of May, they uh, participate in commemorations on the uh, monument aux morts, uh, the dead uh, memorials, yep. I'd say, and, and they are in full uniform and they present arms and everything, and uh, it's a great way to, to participate in that sense. But uh, it depends, because then you, we can talk about German reenactment in France, French people doing uh, German 1940, Second World War German reenactment, uh -huh. yeah. it's a more sensitive issue. Because, uh, and I noticed that in England it's not the same. I think because well, one country was occupied and the other wasn't. For mm -hmm. example, you yeah, can't yeah. Uh, show swastikas and uh, SS uh, color insignias, you know, um, in uh, public events. It's forbidden, like in Germany. Ah, right, okay. Yeah. Um, um, but uh, for example, in uh, I know that in the UK it's uh, allowed. Uh, there, there are no problems with it. Uh, I don't really have an opinion on this subject. I just think that uh, we have to. It's some people would come to um, come to events and they see a German soldier, and it's a bit of a shock sometimes, especially for for old people. I notice that sometimes when I'm talking to German reenactors at an event, there's always there's always a guy that comes and say. Uh, Ah, you're German. You you represent uh, uh, the 
uh, the his, the horrible history that this that they did in France and everything. I can understand this feeling, you know, but uh, it's also uh, sometimes we need to represent also the other side. We were if you just show an American soldier in that reenactment and not the German soldier that was in front of him, what's the point? Yes. No, no, no. That, that's that's fine. I also. I like the thought when you're talking about the, you know, the, the Minister of Culture and the thought of looking at it from an educational point of view, understanding about uh, French history, European history. I think it would help, you know, certainly in terms of having a better understanding, you know, in all countries about just the just a consideration about how these things came to pass, why they were like them, you know, why, uh, you know, looking at it from a from a, an intelligent point of view. But no, look, that, that's a that's a that's a great answer. Look, I'm conscious that we, we've taken quite a lot of uh, time here and there's a, there's a limited amount of time on, on Zoom, I suspect. So what I'd quite like to do is I'd, like, I'd quite like to take a photograph of you if I can, you with your uniform in the background and then on the video and as I put that out, I'll do that if that's okay by you. If I can, if I can just take a couple yeah, of okay. snaps, is that all right? So I'll just uh, will be a second. Right, I can read. Just before we, we, we finish then, I just want to say thanks very much for, you know, for your time for a really great conversation. I've really, really enjoyed it. I've been really, really, uh, a really good chat. And thanks as well for the for the pictures. I'm gonna put them on the, the video the same way I have beforehand. And then I'll no make sure that we cover uh, France 1940, the Polish uh, units, as well as the Soviets uh, uniform as well. And then hopefully that'll come up with a, as a good uh, a good video and a good representation of this conversation, which has been you know really first class. So I really appreciate your time. <laughs> well, thank you also for the invite. I enjoyed also talking about it. <laughs> well, that's great. Okay, well look, take care of yourself, and uh, I'll uh, I'll stay in touch. Yeah, you too. Take care. All right. Thank you. See you. Okay. Bye now. Okay. I hope you enjoyed it. That was a really great uh, video. Really, thanks very much to Nicholas. It's been a really super conversation, really generous with his time, and the pictures are absolutely amazing. If you have any thoughts, please feel free to put comments on the YouTube channel. If you aren't a subscriber so far, then please click and uh, subscribe, click on the bell as well, and you'll get all of the regular videos that are coming out. And if you wanna join some of the Facebook groups, then please do so. There's a Chain of Command, France 1940. There's also the Wargaming World Facebook group as well. Other than that, I hope you've enjoyed it. And uh, just a final message just to say, stay safe, enjoy your wargaming.